Okay, we're still on chapter five and um, we're in the second section and it is called Christ will teach the law of rebirth. It should be interesting. This law is the major corollary of the law of evolution. It has never been grasped or properly understood in the West and in the East where it is acknowledged as a governing principle of life. It is not proved useful because it has been soporific in its effect and a detriment to progress. The Eastern student regards it as giving him plenty of time. This has negated the driving effort to achieve a goal. The average Christian confuses the law of rebirth with what he calls the transmigration of souls and frequently believes that the law of rebirth signifies the passing of human beings into the bodies of animals or lower forms of life, such is by no means the case. As the life of God progresses onwards through form after form, that life in the subhuman kingdom of nature prog proceeds progressively from mineral forms into vegetable forms, and from these vegetable forms into animal forms, from the animal form stage, the life of God passes into the human kingdom and becomes subject to the law of rebirth and not the law of transmigration. To those who know something of the law of rebirth or of reincarnation, the mistake seems ridiculous. <clears throat> well, I, had no, I don't remember seeing this uh, relationship with uh, the transmigration of souls, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's all sorts of uh, different beliefs out there. This, um, these statements here are directly in line with the ageless wisdom and are known uh, by the masters and uh, those who you know, have continuity of consciousness, essentially. And uh, this is a very deep teaching and is uh, is discussed at length in the what I call the blue books, right? um, Alice Bailey, and, and what we're studying right now. Um, but it goes deeper. The doctrine or theory of reincarnation strikes the Orthodox Christian with horror. Yet if one asks him the question which the disciple asked Christ about the blind man, mastered this man's sin, or his fathers that he was born blind from John 9, they confuse the implications or they express amusement or dismay as the case may be. The presentation to the world of thought by the average occult or theosophical exponent has been on the whole deplorable. It has been deplorable because it has been so unintelligently presented the best that can be said is that they have familiarized the general public with the theory. Had it, however, been more intelligently presented, it might have been more generally accepted in the West. Uh, you know, just from my own personal experience quickly, um, and having grown up you know, as, a, as a Catholic and with family who was, you know, long, long time, who were long time Catholics. Reincarnation was, was ultimately never discussed. I imagine it would have been met with horror. I know when I talk about it now, sometimes it's, it's received awkwardly, um, even still. Mm -hmm. You know, my own feeling uh, before I started um, studying was of probably of confusion, you know, like how could this be all? And if this is all, then why are we behaving this way when um, it's outlined not to, right? So that, that, that attitude from the East, I wanna say, is the same attitude as the West without the concept built into it. So it's, it's, it's almost like a blanket re reaction to it. 
Uh, there's an unbelief uh, the, by the unawakened. If the goal of right human relations will be taught universally by the Christ, the emphasis of his teaching must be laid upon the law of rebirth. This is inevitably so because in the recognition of this law will be found the solution of all the problems of humanity and the answer to much of human questioning. You know, and when I, as soon as I see where it says answer to much questioning, I think the answer to that is, or, or my thought behind that is, it seems like we've been doing this for a very long time. And as we talked about going through the mineral, vegetable, animal, and human kingdom, that would uh, allude to uh, much time spent in this process. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions. Right? So this doctrine will be one of the keynotes of the new world religion, as well as the clarifying agent for a better understanding of world affairs. When Christ was here in person before, he emphasized the fact of the soul and the value of the individual. He told men that they could be saved by the life of the soul and of the Christ within the human heart. He said also that except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God in John 3. Only souls can function as citizens of that kingdom, and it was this privileged functioning that he held for the first time before humanity, thus giving men a vision of a divine possibility and an unalterable conclusion to experience. He told them to be ye therefore perfect as your father, which is in heaven is perfect from Matthew five. This time he will teach men the method whereby this possibility can become a, uh, an accomplished fact through the constant return of the incarnating soul to the school of life on earth, there to undergo the perfecting process of which he was the outstanding example. That is the meaning and teaching of reincarnation. Dane Rudyard in his book, New Mansions for New Men, page 123, gives a satisfying definition of this mysterious cosmic and human process. He says that, the individual structure of the new manifestation is necessarily conditioned by the unfulfillment of the past, by the remains, the failures of the past, preserved in the records of nature and the memory of universal substance. The whole story, yours and mine, and that of everyone, is covered in those few words. And that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, we have it you know, buried deep inside of us what we have to do, and, and Christ told us what we have to do, and that is uh, be perfect, and we know we're not, and so, you know, we, we know what, what it's going to take, uh, essentially, we'll know when we get there, uh, and, and until we do, we will keep coming back to progress in that direction. It should be remembered that practically all the occult groups and writings have foolishly laid the emphasis upon past incarnations and upon their recovery. This recovery is incapable of any reasonable checking. Anyone can say and claim anything like the teaching has been laid upon imaginary rules supposed to govern the time equation and the interval between lives, forgetting that time is a faculty of the brain consciousness and that divorce from the brain, time is non-existent. The emphasis has always been laid upon a fictional presentation of relationships. Um, all right, so I, I, I misspoke there. Um, let, me, let me start that over again, because I didn't quite pick up uh, all, all that I should have there either. It should be remembered that practically all the occult groups and writings have foolishly laid the emphasis upon past incarnations and upon their recovery. This recovery is incapable of any reasonable checking. Anyone can say and claim anything they like. The teaching has been laid upon imaginary rules, supposed to govern the time equation and the interval between lives, Forgetting that time is a faculty of the brain consciousness and that divorce from the brain, time is non-existent. 
the emphasis has always been laid upon fictional presentation of relationships. The teaching hitherto given out on reincarnation has done more harm than good. Only one factor remains of value. The existence of a law of rebirth is now discussed by many and accepted by thousands. Beyond the fact that there is such a law, we know little, and those who know from experience the factual nature of this return reject earnestly the foolish and improbable details given out as facts by the theosophical and occult bodies. <clears throat> the laws exist of the details of its working, we know as yet nothing. Only a few things can be said with accuracy about it, and these few warrant no contradiction. One, the law of rebirth is a great natural law upon our planet. Two, it is a process instituted and carried forward under the law of evolution. Three, it is closely related to and conditioned by the law of cause and effect. Four, it is a process of progressive development, enabling men to move forward from the grossest form of unthinking materialism to a spiritual perfection and an intelligent perception which will enable a man to become a member of the kingdom of God. Five, it accounts for the differences among men and in connection with the law of cause and effect, cause the law, I'll call the law of karma in the East. <clears throat> it accounts for differences in circumstances and attitudes to life. Six, it is the expression of the will aspect of the soul and is not the result of any form decision. It is the soul in all forms which reincarnates, choosing and building suitable physical, emotional, and mental vehicles through which to learn the next needed lessons. Seven, the law of rebirth, as far as humanity is concerned, comes into activity upon the soul plane. Incarnation is motivated and directed from the soul level upon the mental plane. Eight, souls incarnate in groups, cyclically, under law, and in order to achieve right relations with God and with their fellow men. Nine, progressive unfoldment, under the law of rebirth, is largely conditioned by the mental principle. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is, so is he. These few brief words need most careful consideration. And, and that's kind of what we said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. We know, no doubt, what we need to work on and, and where we want to get to and, and what that uh, should look like. Not necessarily in, in words either, but in his heart, in our heart. Under the law of rebirth, man slowly develops mind, then mind begins to control the feeling, emotional nature feeling, emotional nature, and finally reveals the soul and its nature and environment to man. Eleven, at that point in his development, the man begins to tread the path of return and orients himself gradually after many lives to the kingdom of God. Twelve, when through a de developed Mentality, wisdom, practical service, and understanding, a man has learned to ask nothing for the separated self. He then renounces desire for life in the three worlds and is freed from the law of rebirth. Thirteen, he is now group conscious, is aware of his soul group and of the soul in all forms, and has attained, as Christ had requested, a stage of Christ-like perfection reaching unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ from Ephesians 4. And Ephesians 4, that's such a deep one. It's referred to quite a bit, right? But yeah, that is, uh, so there were 13, um, I don't know what we call them, um, uh, 13 things. Uh, the law exists and the details of working we know as yet nothing, only a few things can be said with accuracy. So these are the accurate things that are possibly said about, can possibly be said about reincarnation. Beyond this generalization, no intelligent person will attempt to go. When Christ reappears, our knowledge will become more true and realistic. We shall know that we are eternally related to the souls of men, of all men, 
and that we have a definite relationship to those who reincarnate with us, who are learning with us the same lessons who are and who are experiencing and experimenting with us. This proven and accepted knowledge will regenerate the very sources of our human living. We shall know that all our difficulties and all our problems are caused by our failure to recognize this fundamental law with its responsibilities and obligations. We shall then gradually learn to govern our activities by its just and restraining power. The law of rebirth embodies the practical knowledge which men need today to conduct rightly and correctly their religious, political, economic, communal, and private lives, and thus establish right relations with the divine life in all forms. And sure, that's the case because this is eternity. And you're gonna, we keep, you, how are you gonna treat people? You know, we have to treat people um, the way that we would treat them in eternity because guess what? It is. So then, you know, that changes things. You see people differently. And we can look past uh, the faults for the most part. You know, it doesn't mean that they're going to see you differently. And that, that's the hard part initially, I want to say, um, because you want other people to see that. And they're just, they're not, they can't see that yet. Um, and that, that is the hardest part um, when you can see something that, that others can't and you want to share and share in that knowing. Um, but the, the gift is that you can, and, uh, it's a great opportunity. This presents a great opportunity. If you have not, um, allowed the, uh, reincarnation to really sink in, it, it, it should be one of the very first things, um, that that's really contemplated deeply because it, it will expand. Uh, there's an expansion in that because time itself becomes you know, much bigger. Now that doesn't mean we get comfortable and figure we have plenty of time like those in the East, but you do have to settle into eternity. That's, a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, we're moving on to the uh, to the next teaching that Christ will bring, and so that was the second, the law of rebirth, and this uh, that was past right human relations, and this third part of his teachings that will come are the revelation of the mysteries of initiation, and just before we even get into this, it's you know we had uh, read the uh, from Bethlehem to Calvary before this and which got into the, some of the mysteries um, and all of these books uh, of the ageless wisdom really um, I want to say it's embedded in it it's not something to solely focus on but it's always kind of there uh, Because the pro our, the, our, the process of the human is happening on bigger and bigger, uh, bigger scales. So it's important to understand this. Uh, and if, if we can see it from this side, from the human level, then we can start to see uh, bigger and bigger from there. Because what do they say? Uh, man, know thyself, and once you know yourself, then you can start to see how many more things uh, fall into place. So, much that is here written and which is conveyed in these pages is in reality concerned with the appearance of the kingdom of God, an appearance which can now take place because of three factors. One, the growth of that kingdom on earth and the thousands of people who recognize its laws and endeavor to live in accordance with its rules and spirit, you know, which is what I want to say is what we're trying to do is get, uh, is to get in line 
right? That's that's the goal of reincarnation. So now that, that's growing into this here um, because we, uh, we recognize it and uh, we endeavor to live in accordance with its rules and spirit, certainly. It, and even in recognizing uh, how difficult the process is, we're, we're working in that direction. The fact that the signs of the time and the widespread need of humanity have evoked the Christ and that he has decided to reappear. That was number two. Uh, and number three is the invocative cry of humanity is ascending hourly to the secret place of the Most High. And the hierarchy plans to emerge when Christ appears and restores the rule of the spirit on earth. The hour for the restoration of the ancient mysteries has arrived. Well, thank God. And, you know, I would assume this has much to do with uh, what we're capable of receiving uh, from the mental plane, right? The unfoldment uh, that, that we can experience. These facts have been widely given out during the past uh, during the past two years as a result of the cleansing of the earth through the medium of the World War, uh, 1914 to 1945, and through the suffering to which humanity has been subjected, with an equally potent purifying effect, which we'll demonstrate later. It will then be possible for the hierarchy of the Church of Christ, hitherto invisible, to externalize itself and to function openly upon the physical plane. This will indicate a return to the situation which existed in Atlantean days when, to use biblical symbology, Genesis chapter 2 and 3, God himself walked among men. He talked with them, and there was no barrier between the kingdom of men and the kingdom of God. Divinity was then present in physical form, and the members, uh, the members of the spiritual hierarchy were openly guiding and directing the affairs of humanity as far as man's innate freedom permitted. Now, in the immediate future and on a higher turn of the spiral of life, this will again happen. The masters will walk openly among men. The Christ will reappear in physical presence. Another thing that will happen will be that the ancient mysteries will be restored. The ancient landmarks will again be recognized. Those landmarks which masonry has so earnestly preserved and which have been hitherto securely embalmed in the Masonic rituals, waiting the day of restoration and of resurrection. These ancient mysteries were originally given to humanity by the hierarchy and contain the entire clue to the evolutionary process hidden in numbers, in ritual, in words, and in symbology. These veil the secret of man's origin and destiny, picturing to him in rite and ritual the long, long path which he must tread back into the light. They provide also, when rightly interpreted and correctly represented, the teaching which humanity needs in order to pass from darkness to light from the unreal to the real, and from death to immortality. Any true Mason who understands, even if only to a slight degree, the significance of the three degrees of the Blue Lodge and the implications of that in which he participates will recognize the above three phases for what they are and will recognize the significance of the three degrees. I mention it here with Masonic purpose because it is closely related to the restoration of the mysteries and has held the clue down the ages so that long awaited restoration to the platform upon which the required teaching can be based and the structure which can, uh, which can express the history of man's moving forward upon the path of return. Uh -huh. and it, and can be expressed when Friedovich Jewish names and nomenclature, which are long out of date, though right 3,000 years ago. <clears throat> you know, when it's mentioned that, uh, it's mentioned in one of the blue books that uh, an illumin, uh, you know, illuminated Masons will restore 
uh, the mysteries and revive them uh, with newer terminologies. It is these mysteries which Christ will restore upon his appearance, thus reviving the churches in a new form and restoring the hidden mystery which they all have lost through their materialism. Masonry has also lost the true livingness it once possessed, but in its forms and rituals, the truth is preserved and can be recovered. This Christ will do. He will also revive these mysteries in other ways. Not all will seek the church or masonry for the revitalizing of their spiritual life. The true mysteries will also reveal themselves through science and the incentive to search for them uh, there, the incentive to search to them there will be given by the Christ. The mysteries contain within their formulas and teachings the key to the science which will unlock the mystery of electricity, the greatest spiritual science and area of divine knowledge in the world, the fringes of which have only been just been touched. Only when the hierarchy is present visibly on earth and the mysteries of which the disciples of the Christ are the custodians are given openly to the world, will the true secret and nature of electrical phenomena be revealed. These mysteries are, in the last analysis, the true source of revelation. It can only be when the mind and the will to good are closely fused and blended and are thus conditioning human behavior that the extent of the coming revelation can be safely grasped. There are planetary energies and forces which men as yet cannot and do not control. They know nothing of them, and yet upon them the life of the planet is dependent. They are also closely related to the despised psychic powers, today so stupidly approached and, ign and ignorantly used, yet these powers, when correctly assessed and used, will prove of enormous usefulness in the sciences which the mysteries will reveal. Wow, that is very interesting there. I, and you can just imagine uh, in reading that, what that might indicate. Uh, and I'm, I'm not even gonna mention, I'm not even gonna go there, but you, you know, I think we can, there's something to be seen there. Um, so psychic powers will be proved, uh, pro Prove of enormous usefulness in the sciences which the mysteries will reveal. And I, in my mind, we're not talking about psychic nature, you know, man on man. You know, I'll just, I'll leave it, we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Because I don't know. The mystery of the ages is through the reappearance of the Christ on the verge of revelation. Through the revelation of the soul, that, that mystery, which soul knowledge veils, will stand revealed. The scriptures of the world have ever prophesied that at the end of the age, we shall see the revelation of that which is secret and the emergence of that which has hitherto been concealed into the light of day. As we know, our present cycle marks the end of the Piscean age. The next 200 years will see the uh, abolition of death, or rather of our misconception as to death, and the firm establishing of the fact of the soul's existence. The soul will then be known to be an entity, and the motivating impulse and the spiritual force behind all manifested forms. The work of the Christ 2,000 years ago was to proclaim certain great possibilities and the existence of great powers. His work, when he reappears, will be to prove the fact of these possibilities and to reveal the true nature and potency of man. The proclamation he made that we were all sons of God and own, uh, and own one universal father. Wait, I mean, let me start that again. The proclamation he made that we are all sons of God and own one universal father will, in the near future, no longer be regarded as a beautiful, mystical, and symbolic statement, but will be regarded as a proved 
scientific pronouncement. We're all sons of God and of one universal father. Our universal brotherhood and our essential immortality will be proven to be facts in nature. Well, that'll be certainly an interesting thing. Uh, I look forward to that. The ground is being prepared at this time for the great restoration which Christ will engineer. The world religions, including Christianity and Masonry, are today before the judgment seat of humanity's critical mind. The word has gone forth almost unanimously that both of them have failed in their divinely assigned tasks. It is realized everywhere that new life must be poured in but this will take a new vision and a new approach to living conditions. And this only the appearance of the Christ can teach and help us bring about. As an ancient scripture says, that which has been a mystery shall no longer be so. And that which has been veiled will now be revealed. That which has been withdrawn will emerge into the light and will then enhance that light and all men will see and together will rejoice. The time will come when destruction will have wrought its beneficent work. Then men, through suffering, will seek that which they have discarded. In vain pursuit, they sought that which was near at hand and easy of attainment. Possessed, they found that it proved an agency of death. Yet all the time, they sought for life, not death. Yeah. That, that sounds uh, it sounds right. We know not what we do. Right? We don't even know what we're what we're seeking. Hmm. And the Christ will bring them life and life abundantly. There is much talk these days concerning the mysteries of initiation. Every country is full of spurious teachers teaching the so-called mysteries often offering spurious initiations, usually at a cost and with a diploma and misleading the people. Christ himself taught that just before he came, this state of affairs would be found and that everywhere the false and the spurious would be proclaiming themselves. All this is, however, but indicative of his coming. The counterfeit ever guarantees the true. The talk, the discussions, the silly claim making, the pseudo occultism, and the futile efforts to take an initiation, that undistinguished phrase which ignorant ignorant theosophical teachers have coined to express a deep spiritual experience, have been distinctive of the esoteric teaching ever since its modern inception in 1875. Now, the, the theosophical viewpoint and uh, this, these books are the teachings are absolutely in line and and, and belong together. Um, they are together. Um, this is this is a long time ago. There were things happening uh, inside of the Theosophical Society at the time that were not. Um, Mature is probably the best word, and uh, but this is a long time ago, um, and things have things have changed. I don't know the inner workings of the Theosophical Society, but I'm I I'm very uh, I, I have reverence for it, and I very much enjoy the teachings that are given, um, and I've even gone to a retreat of theirs and. Uh, I found it to be very beautiful, and I I wanted to go again this year, but it turns out I can't. But anyway, um, not to say that I'm I'm not I'm not in buried into the um, you know and I'm not in in the inner circle of that stuff. I but I I do enjoy being around people who kind of understand the same 
same same things. I guess like anybody else. Uh, so that, like I said, this is a long time ago. Then H.P. Blavatsky brought to the attention of the Western world the fact that great disciples and masters of the wisdom were present on earth, obedient to the guidance of the Christ. Later, she deeply regretted doing this as some of her papers issued to her esoteric section proclaimed. That's not a part of the esoteric section. Yet what she did was all a part of the great plan and was no mistake. The interpretations and the excited reactions of the theosophists of her time were the mistake, a mistake which they have not yet acknowledged. And that, again, this is back then, this stupid reaction was aided and helped by the inquisitive nature of humanity itself, as well as by its aspiration, which was undoubtedly aroused thereby. Men also, full of cupidity and commercial greed, exploited the theme and are still doing so. You know, it's not hard to see these things um, in the world today. Um, you don't have to go very far to give uh, some shaman or uh, or somebody some money uh, to get some very surface level teachings and and uh, and be signed off as as initiated uh, to some of them right that's not to say all by by any stretch of the imagination uh, the total effect of all these stupidities and errors of presentation has nevertheless been good in all lands, men today are aware of the existence of the masters and of the possibility offered and the opportunity presented to make scientific spiritual progress and thus become members of the kingdom of God. This the churches had ignored and had, in the Victorian age particularly, looked upon science as an arch enemy. All this flood of information about the mysteries of initiation, some of it indicative of a hidden truth, some of it the fabrications of an aspirational imagination and some commercially instigated has definitely prepared humanity for the teaching it is believed Christ will give when he, when again, he, when again here with us in physical presence, sorry, the teaching, uh -oh. let me read that again. Uh, aspirational imagination, some commercial and uh, commercially instigated, has definitely prepared humanity for the teaching it is believed Christ will give when again here with us in physical presence. Little as the Orthodox Christian may care to admit it, the entire gospel story and its four forms or presentations contains little else except symbolic details about the mysteries, which are, as far as humanity is concerned, five in all. These mysteries indicate, in reality, five important points in the spiritual history of an aspirant. They indicate also five important stages in the progress of human consciousness. This advance will become definite and clear in a manner not understood today at some point during the Aquarian age. Humanity, the world disciple, through its various groups of all, uh, all at various stages of unfoldment, will enter into new states of awareness and into new realms or spheres of mental and spiritual consciousness during the next 2,000 years. And, and these mysteries, we're talking about five, five important points in the spiritual history. And after, these are the initiations that we're referring to. And these, I, I, these are the initiations that were given in... Uh, from Bethlehem to Calvary as well. Each age has left a reflection of a modern fivefold development upon it. Four ages have just passed away. Astronomically speaking, Gemini, Taurus, Aries, and Pisces. Today, Aquarius, the fifth age, is coming into power. In Gemini, its symbolical sign of the two pillars sets, set its seal upon the Masonic fraternity of the time and the two pillars of Jachin and Boaz, 
uh, to give them their Jewish names, which are, of course, not their real names, came into being approximately 8,000 years ago. Then came Taurus, the bull, wherein Mithra came as the world teacher and instituted the mysteries of Mithras with an apparent worship of the bull. Next followed Aries, the ram, which saw the start of the Jewish dispensation, which is of importance to the Jews and unfortunately of importance to the Christian religion, but of no importance to the untold millions in other parts of the world. During this cycle, uh, during this cycle came the Buddha, Sri Krishna, and Sankaracharya. Finally, we have the age of Pisces, the fishes, which brought to us to Christ. The sequence of the mysteries, which each, a, each of the signs of the zodiac embodies, will be clarified for us by the Christ, because the public consciousness today demands something more definite and spiritually real than modern astrology or all the pseudo-occultism so widely extended. An error which lies ahead after the reappearance of the Christ, hundreds of thousands of men and women everywhere will pass through some one or other of the great expansions of consciousness. But the mass reflection will be that of the renunciation. Though this does not mean that the masses will by any means take the fourth initiation. They will renounce the materialistic standards which today control in every layer of the human family. One of the lessons to be learned by humanity at the present time, a time which is the antechamber of the new age, is how few material things are really necessary to life and happiness. The lesson is not yet learned. It is, however, essentially one of the values to be extracted out of this period of appalling deprivations through which men are every day passing. The real tragedy is that the West in the West is that the Western Hemisphere, particularly the United States, will not share in this definite spiritual and vitalizing process. They are at present too selfish to permit it to happen. Now, on the whole, that may absolutely be the case, but I have to say, um, as far as the United States goes, when you look at, uh, you ask how few material things are really necessary to life and happiness, ask a soldier, or somebody that was in the military that lived out of their backpacks or rucksacks for any period of time, and they'll tell you how happy during, and, and free they felt. Some, I'm not going to say all the time, that would be ridiculous. But but you realize you don't need much and you are still happy no matter where you are in the world. Um, and then you come back and then all of life is, is pushed back on you again and all the materialism is thrown back on us again. Right? But we, it is known very well by soldiers that not much is needed. You can see, therefore, that initiation is not a ceremonial procedure or an accolade conferred upon a successful aspirant. Neither is it a penetration into the mysteries of which the mysteries of masonry are as yet only the pictorial presentation, but is simply the result of experiencing livingness on all three levels of awareness, physical, emotional, and mental. And through that livingness, bringing into activity those registering and those recording cells within the brain substance, which have hitherto not been susceptible to the higher impression. I'm going to read that again. Through that livingness, bringing into activity those registering and those recording cells within the brain substance, which have hitherto not been susceptible to the higher impression. So, right in that. Is a these are is a very deep concept here, where you can pretty much take everything you ever thought and and, and just clear your desk off with one nice failed swoop and just let it all let it all go. We don't know anything, and this right here really hits home to express that how little we actually do know. 
right. um, initiation is not a ceremonial procedure. It's not an accolade. It's not conferred upon a successful aspirant. Um, neither is it a penetration into the mysteries of which the mysteries of masonry are as yet a pictorial presentation, but is simply the result of experiencing livingness on all three levels of awareness. And through that livingness, uh, bringing into activity uh, those registering and recording cells within the brain. That is unbelievable. Through this expanding area of registration, or if you prefer it, through the development of a finer recording instrument or responsive apparatus, the mind is enabled to become the transmitter of higher values and of spiritual understanding. Thus, the individual becomes aware of areas of divine existence and states of consciousness, which are always eternally present, but which the individual man was constitutionally unable to contact or to register, neither the mind nor its recording agent, the brain, were able to form the angle of their evolutionary development. And that's also deep. When the searchlight of the mind is penetrating slowly into hitherto unrecognized aspects of the divine mind, when the magnetic qualities of the heart are awakened and becoming sensitively responsive to both the other aspects, then the man becomes able to function in the new unfolding realms of light, love, and service, he is initiate. These are the mysteries with which the Christ will deal. His acknowledged presence with us and presence of his disciples will make possible a far more rapid development than would otherwise be the case. The stimulation of the objective hierarchy will be increasingly potent and the Aquarian age will see so many of the sons of men accepting the great renunciation, that world effort will be on the same scale as the mass education of mankind in the Piscean age. Wow, okay, that's deep. Materialism as a mass principle will be rejected and the major spiritual values will assume greater control. And, and, you know, Master DK mentions that, you know, teaching through analogy is, uh, is, is a proper, um, provides the right um, assimilation, I guess, or synthesis. But it's interesting here, he says that the world effort will be on the same scale as the mass education of mankind in the Piscean age. And the mass education is, it's almost, it was you know, almost everyone was getting some, most were getting some education and, and Granted, some were falling through the cracks, but um, it was on a mass scale. The culmination of a civilization with its special note, quality, and gifts to posterity is significant of the reflection of the spiritual intent and through its mass populations of one of the initiate initiations. History will someday be based and written upon the record of the initiatory growth of humanity. Prior to that, we must have a history which is constructed around the development of humanity under the influences of great and fundamental ideas. That is the next historical presentation. The production of the cult. The production of the culture of any given period is simply the reflection of the creative ability and the precise consciousness of the initiates of the time. Those who knew they were initiate and were also conscious of admittance into direct relation with the hierarchy. Wait, I'm going to have to read that again. The production of the culture of any given period is simply the reflection of the creative ability and the precise consciousness of the initiates of the time, those who knew they were initiate and were also conscious of admittance into direct relation with the hierarchy. The 
that that made it much clearer there, uh, rereading it. At present, we use neither of these two words, civilization and culture, in their rightful sense or with their true meaning. Civilization is the reflection in the mass of men of some particular cyclic influence leading to an initiation. Culture is esoterically related to those within any era of civilization who specifically, precisely, and in full waking consciousness through self-initiated effort penetrate into those inner realms of thought activity, which we call the creative world. These are the realms which are responsible for the outer civilization. So culture is, wow, okay. That is something to contemplate. Civilization is the reflection in the mass of men of some particular cyclic influence leading to an initiation. That's very deep in and of itself. And then uh, culture is esoterically related to those within any area of civilization who specifically, precisely, and in full waking consciousness through self-initiated effort penetrated in, penetrate into those inner realms of thought activity, which we call the creative world. Okay. The reappearance of the Christ is indicative of a closer relation between the outer and the inner worlds of thought. Makes perfect sense. The world of meaning and the world of experience will be obviously blended through the stimulation of the advent of the hierarchy and of its head, the Christ. A tremendous, tremendous growth of understanding and of relationships will be the major result. That is, uh, that's pretty great stuff there. So, so far, uh, we know that, uh, we're going to leave it here for today, but so far we know that Christ is bringing right human relations. Uh, is, let me see here. Let me just make sure I got this correct. Uh, right human relations uh, will teach the law of rebirth. And then the revelation of the mysteries of initiation. And then we will get into tomorrow the dispelling, he'll teach how to dispel glamour. And there's literally a book uh, that Master DK, who's part of this book, wrote, and it's called Glamour. And it, it's all about um, glamour, on the and much about the astral plane, and how to clear ourselves from it um, and, and prepare ourselves to, to leave the astral plane behind. Um, and, 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 you know, be able to see through it more or less and see it for what it is, um, kind of part that part the veil a little bit on the astral plane so we can, um, so we can see. All right, I'm going to leave it there for today. And then we will uh, pick it back up tomorrow. Have a good night. Thanks.